store. How would you like this show? Beautiful. You have to say good. <laughs> Excellent. You have to say we are all genius. <laughs> genius only exists one percent or even this. But I think we are very fortunate to have all the talented artists for this show or previous show. Always ongoing shows. We are so blessed to have wonderful, talented, and kind human beings. And thank you very much for being who you are. Thank you. So, a few more minutes we will have. Anybody could do something soft too up there? <laughs> few more minutes seems like one hour, doesn't it? it it's almost like drifting the bed. <laughs> never, never come down quick enough. <laughs> so two others they are coming, they are rushing. By the time they got here, they are swept. <laughs> no, they're not. <laughs> Would you like to say something though? What did you like about this show? Maybe there are some people who who are part of this um, exhibitions, but those who are not, I want to hear your opinions. I think that my opinion is wonderful. It's very colorful. It's very interesting to see so many different ideas of the people. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay, I say that I, I really like humanity for the art, for some different forms, and different colors, and it's, it's not, nothing that like is, everything is so different from this one, that it's really very interesting to see that. Thank you for inviting me to watch your Okay. I would like to mention to you, she is one of the participants. Her pieces are right there, almost like declining horizontally. She is ready to sleep. Another one is standing, is standing, skinny standing one. And then you have to mention your name. So I'm Clarita Report. Uh, I will talk about me later. <laughs> Oh yes, from what? Oh, I was born in Colombia. I have been in New York for 30 years, so 35 years. It's like an honor in New York. <laughs> yes, I love this city. The first time I came here, I said, oh my God, I feel like I'm living all my life here. Mm -hmm. Everything was so close to me. It's like it. So I'm coming back to my, to my country that was Colombia, or is Colombia. I'm preparing myself mentally to come. Because to come here without papers, without any connection, is not really easy. <laughs> so everybody thought that was very crazy. Yeah. I said, I'm crazy about going now. <laughs> when I was young, I used to come now, I don't mind you to say that. <laughs> There was, a show, there was a show I saw at the NAP, the Museum of Art and Design, and it was called Against the Grain. And it opened my eyes as to what could be done with wood. And this show introduced paper to me in a new way. Uh, I was blown away by what could be done with paper, the intricacies, the layers of development that you know, gets sort of brought out of paper. And during the opening, I brought my son, who was four years old, and he's really getting into paper collaging, and I thought he would really enjoy it. And I showed him the work, and I was you know, really expecting him to be blown away, and he told me, no, that's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. And all two of those pieces are, he's going to talk about his work. But I want to mention to you, those are the three pieces that he found at the bottom of the river. 
Перелив с неба. Неба выбор. Мы с того. Монда Фенчи Провин Чуду выбор. Дик Дэй Эви Уорд. You can imagine what a creative mind he has. He will talk about that. Okay, so one of our ideas behind, behind you, Gren, you know, you're not supposed to look at him, he's very shy. But I understand how humiliating it is to talk about one's work and indeed very modest individual he is. So I we have to wait until Beatrice comes. Beatrice Coron is a French artist and this black and white cutting paper. So she usually uses Tidex, that's the name of the paper that doesn't tear. And it is a product of, um, what's the name of that company? It's in Washington, D.C., never in Africa. Anyhow, they create plastic papers too. But we are waiting for the artists to come. And by the way, I know you're from Colombia. I've been there to your country. Wonderful. I travel for an entire month. By bus, it was very fun. Are you from Bogota? Unfortunately, unfortunately, we don't have good management in there, so we call it to be really in the uh, I left because I said I cannot do nothing for the country. I was feeling very bad. <laughs> that was a strong enough fight to do the things there. But I invite you to visit the country now. It's being very more peaceful. It's easy to walk around and the trade the birds. Is something that the Europeans go on to see the people also because it's unbelievable the variety that we have there. Um, that is also we have the best coffee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have villages are also very nice, very beautiful. Uh, Bogota is the capital. It's like the 73. No, I'm sorry. It's like 70 in, in the centenarians. It's like, let's see, 50, 50 in, for, yeah, <laughs> 50, 60. Okay, I have changed a lot. Now that you said, uh, changing the, the time, so, yes. Did you have your quiz? Yeah, I don't know. Yes. Very interesting, indeed. It's nice to have, you know, people from abroad, and you might go to Colombia. Yeah. It's a wonderful, beautiful city. Middle is, I couldn't go because it's a part there at that time. You know, lo oh, lots yeah. of drug, drug traffic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now it's getting better. Now here goes another arrival here. Beatrice, why are you? Okay. We just talk about you so badly. <laughs> <laughs> so she has just arrived. And she made it. We are waiting for you patiently. Thank you for coming. So, as I said, our first person. Yeah, I want some music. Our first person is Christopher Buffet. His pieces are one is standing on the pedestal, the same one, back and front and the other one on the wall. He has a physical problem, so he couldn't make it today, I'm sorry. So the second one is a 
Gary Grant. He sounds like an actor, doesn't he? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Of course, he is a very famous Hollywood actor, and he can perform in front of you. But his talent is another talent. You can see right on top of wonderful, colorful one. And that is Gary Grant, please. So, would you please start talking? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so where to begin? <laughs> um, so I could just briefly talk about uh, about this work and some of my uh, some of the the new pieces that I've done in the past couple of years because it's been it's been a total transformation of my work, uh, a complete transformation of my work. And and so what you're seeing is one of many of these these very sort of monumental multi-dimensional works uh, that I've managed to develop. And uh, it took well over three to four years. Um, during the time of COVID 2020, uh, I had the best opportunity to be in my studio for long periods of time to really hone in on this, this new technique. And, and what originally started this particular technique uh, before the wood was basically works that I've done on handmade paper. And it all comes, um, let's say, six and a half years ago when I, me and my wife, we took a trip to Morocco, all right? And I spent time, uh, we spent time in Morocco. And I, and I tell this story to a lot of artists. Say, Any artist who ever traveled to Morocco, it will totally, at least it done, done it for me, it, it totally transformed me. I think from that point on, it took me a year afterwards, after coming off that, that whole experience of, of, uh, of walking around in the old city in Marrakesh and among other places, just seeing all of the, at least I think some of the most talented, very well crafted elements uh, and design all across the uh, across the city, and so it was truly uh, I think inspirational for any artist, particularly for me to go there and, and witness that, and I picked up on a lot of that. And basically, I think it just simply shifted my my whole thinking and my whole work. It was a total 360. And, um, but part of that was, uh, I think part of that inspiration was, uh, is from the history itself. And that's what kind of started this, uh, this roadmap uh, with this new work, is basically getting involved, learning a little bit more about history. And then, and then it led into, you know, like, like old monuments and really things that kind of dates back to you know, a thousand years ago, back to Egypt, and even beyond that. And so that's been sort of my whole focus now, is, is to kind of go back and, and sort of re relive these moments, you know, particularly a lot of the monumental structure that was, that was built by man. And to this day, um, I mean, a lot of the scientists, engineers, are still grappling over some of these monuments that's been built, you know, and then, I, then more of a, a personal fo a focus for me, but basically, you know, a lot of the, what I call untold stories in Africa, in different parts of Africa, there's been a lot of, you know, very, very masterful, unique structures and civilizations that's been built during the time of Egypt and some of the other places. And a lot of people don't even know about it. <laughs> and so that was sort of my investigation of, of learning more and more about these discoveries of different places. And so with that combination, that little bit of history and a little bit of architecture, and then I'm an abstract artist, so I was able to kind of mix all that together to kind of form this particular piece. So in the beginning, it started out with works on handmade paper. I was doing a lot of the inspirational designs and, uh, and imagery from Morocco on handmade paper first. And then I'll, I'm always known to produce large scale works. And so I wanted to start small and start to focus on this new, I wanted a, a different direction with this handmade paper uh, techniques. So, so that was my journey. And then once I got comfortable with this technique, 
and then finding the right uh, handmade paper to accept all of my all of my media. All right, so I use very unusual materials because I've become I'm coming from a sort of restoration frame restoration background over 20 years, and I used to work for one of the oldest frame shops here in New York uh, when I first got here, and basically it's restoring antique frames. A lot of the period frames, let's say the 17th, 18th century French. Uh, this particular uh, frame shop has the largest collection of period frames. And so with the clients that, that I was working with, they would actually come in and request certain period frames to be, to be produced. And so me and the rest of the team would go in and we would take this particular antique frame and then build it and then replicate it by hand all the way down to the finish. And so I've been responsible for doing the different finishes, the technical finishes of antique frames, which is applying genuine gold leaf, which is gilding, using those same traditional materials in, in framing, you know, and then being able to achieve that same look. So if you can imagine seeing a gold frame done by hand, and then the opportunity to, to make it look old, basically kind of destroy it a little bit. <laughs> but then all those little hidden uh, techniques that I've learned over the years, I continue to this day to use this in my work. And so for me, with those techniques of gilding and these different finishes that I've done, I'm able to go across all different mediums, you know, from canvas, now the handmade paper, and then basically now falling back into wood, which is from the very beginning of it. So, uh, so this has been a uh, it's been a journey, and even during the show, when Hugo asked, she she actually requested two of my paintings. <laughs> so I had another large piece that I was going to try to bring here, but unfortunately, it was it's so big and it's so heavy, <laughs> just like this one. I I could only take <laughs> I was only successful enough to bring in one piece. So uh, and so this is the piece I chose to uh, to submit. It was amazing, the the artistas. Um, it hardly fit on this wall. So I was forced to do this. <laughs> she was encouraging me to do that. I was like, I didn't want to do it because it was so heavy. But I trust her judgment, and and she was correct. And so I made an effort to try to get this painting up, and I hung it up there. So, uh, but as you notice, like one piece is missing <laughs> because I was trying. Trying to hold it up and try to get it in, and then one piece sort of fell off. So I was trying to get back here to repair it, but I said I, I just didn't have the time. So yeah. so when I do take it home today, it's going back back home on the table to rest and then get repaired. <laughs> it's so wonderful, Mary. Believe it or not, and that is red, green, black. They are wood, but he built it. He put that. Um, what's the name? Gold leaf. Yeah. So it looks like a metal. Amazing piece. It's so heavy, too. Well, before you, I was supposed to talk on behalf of Graham Goodenough. And then Graham Goodenough <coughs> is not here. In spirit, he does. He exists. The piece that you can see behind it. Gary is a plywood. He called it bonsai. Yeah, it's a plywood. Another one is right here, not done. And he might he might put the light inside, and then you, you can see interesting patterns. I don't know how he created it. I wish I could talk to him in person. If he were here, are you there? He can explain to us remarkable piece because each time when you look, it's a different form. Another one, this he found, um, found object. You see, he economized everything, which I really appreciate because Mother Nature, this show is about product of Mother Nature. If we use too much, nothing will be left. So we have to economize 
and we have to treat Mother Nature tenderly. And that's the whole point about this paper and workshop. Previously, we had clay and textile, and clay and textile is also the product of nature. If you use this use, it's not going to be available for the future. And I'm sure I'm saying by any moment my age, but I always think about next generation after next generation so that we can survive. Thank God, I always say thank, thank my parents, thank my ancestors. That's why we are all here. You never know the life is very vulnerable, but we have to enjoy the moment as much as possible. So, the grain, could you please lift a piece behind it? That is paper mache. Could you lift it? Sorry about this. So, he used paper to make this form and hold a paper mache. Remarkably, is three pieces, one plywood, another one he found among junk, would be cut, another one is paper. So it is perfectly three pieces he presented here, fit into these things. So this show is about wood and paper. So he had paper mache, he had a plywood. Plywood is much cheaper than hard wood, as you know, and then this painted dark ones, he found it on the street. It is a detritus. So, I want to thank Duren. Where are you? I think somewhere he is here. He is listening. So, so I have to speak on his, on his behalf. Thank you. Next one is a gentlewoman, <laughs> Kumi Hiroshi. And so her teeth, her teeth is a light, they're very colorful. Um, cats, cats table on the floor. And another one is a chair. Would you like to talk about it? You can see she died on her hair for two days, so that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there she is. I would like people who look at my artwork to feel positive, such as energetic, cute, interesting, beautiful, and cool. And I would be really happy if people all over the world who knew my artwork could gain the feeling of good energy and good mood and be happy. So the impetus for making this work was the cat design. Pom pom and the butterfly toys are cute. Purely what I thought was the trigger. This is so funny. <laughs> she, she can speak English better than I can. What's the point of reading? <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> Did you understand? I think she better speak better than reading. Her reading was so poor. <laughs> Anyhow, you understood that though. Yes. 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 She always makes amazing. Anime type, she is from Japan, and pop art. And she was the one who spread the word throughout the world. 
you saw pop art again, I show you the, how would you say you're very colorful, very acid color you use, but you make such a charming, absolutely charming images. Look at this cat. Can you imagine if you had a coffee on that table, you become laughing. <laughs> Indeed. So that's what she does. She's a wonderful painter, and then she also makes three dimensional pieces. Did you did you understand? Okay. Good. Thank you very much, Kumi. Okay. All right. So next one is a miraculous Koron. Okay. Yeah, so uh, my piece is just behind, it's black and white. And uh, my, uh, my way of doing art is writing visual stories. So I'm a visual writer and I'm very interested in how we see the world. And my, uh, my way of making uh, the stories is to make movement and situation. And I make all the silhouettes, bodies, in a kind of imbalance at the apex of the movement. So you kind of know what happened before and what happened after, because it's so imbalanced that you see the movement. So lately, I've been very interested in the books of Lionel Nabak, and it's a neurobiologist. And he explained how we, we make memories in our brain with the unconscious. And so he also explained in detail, I'm not going to go there, but how our eyes see. And in our eyes, so we have the cornea, and behind we have uh, rods and cones. The rods, we have about 120 million of them, and they only see black and white, and kind of blurry, so it's like the silhouettes. And the drawn, with the cones, we have about 6 million, and they are the ones who see the colors. And in fact, we only see fixed images. And our cortex, we make movies. And we remake our memories. That's why we never have the same memories when we live the same moment. That's why eyewitness are very unreliable for police lines and all the kind of things. And uh, we are relying on how we are making the fiction to ourselves. So I thought it was very interesting because movies, it's 24 images a second. But our memory, it's 14 images or 13, they say depends on the attention between 10 and 13 images per second. So that means we are feeling a lot of things and uh, I find it very fascinating. My subjects um, are about all kinds of stories on the back. It's uh, Memories from Brooklyn, so that was a commission from uh, the New York Historical Society. So I did the high five, so I have the five balls with all kind of stories. And uh, the stories are uh, made in cut paper in an edition of four. That's why I can have one set at the New York Historical Society and one Brooklyn here. And the way I'm making it, it's relying on my memories. On uh, I was a tour guide before, so I have a lot of uh, things with that. And also, I'm uh, completely uh, rapture with the notion of self and the identity. So one of my ongoing projects right now, it's a virtual artist book with uh, Rutgers University. And I'm working with the director of the virtual world, <laughs> Rick Anderson. So it's uh, quite amazing to explore the labyrinth of self and how we project our stories and how we perceive the stories. And as all other artists, I'm a sponge on uh, current affair. So gender, race, ecology, it all blend into the work. So which means uh, the work I did uh, on this Brooklyn, if I were doing it today, it was two, two years ago, uh, it would be another Brooklyn. And next year will be another one. So every time I revisit the story and they become different. And the way I'm uh, portraying the stories, I project also the memory I got from them. But people looking at them have their own stories. So it's kind of an evolving thing where it's not fixed. It's just some elements and people can remake their fiction. 
because everything is self-fiction and uh, how we relate to stories and how we relate to history. So I think it's a fascinating subject that I'm always visiting, revisiting, expanding, and, um, and as well as the movement in fixed image, how we make movies from stills. Elders, thank you very much. Yes. And absolutely interesting. She always brings our maiden piece with the black and white. The unveiling black and white. Matching. By the way, we argued one, one evening when she brought this big piece. So I said, This is a Brooklyn. And where is our building? <laughs> we are so upset. I was. And this is a landmark building, a national treasure building. How could she forget to not to include? And she said, I'm sure it's there, but she couldn't find it. <laughs> so I said, we have to make something special for us. And look how kind of her. She created quickly those two pieces identical down below. That is our building. So she gave it to us. Yes, you go, you are there in multiple places because yes. you can do multiple things at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And then we found where your building was in the big yeah, yeah. 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 In the end, the artist didn't remember. And that's what it happens when she or he is creating totally absurd. And then after he or she finished, the next, next project you jump in. So one doesn't remember, I don't remember, I was a painter, I don't remember. Maybe the God created it, that's what I always assume. Isn't that true? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Every project washed the uh, yes. last one, so everything is fresh again. Yeah, that's right. Always refreshing. And then when we are talking now, Proceeding to another second, things in the past mixed with our mental process. And so, when we point out things in the past, we are talking about now, even though we are thinking about things in the past, but we are talking at this moment. That is a philosophical issue we can talk about, not today. So, I thank you very much for those wonderful pieces, our buildings, and I think me and Terry are there too. <laughs> and if you can take a look at, and she had a wonderful uh, show at the Symmetrical Societies. This happened to be Brooklyn, and then she created four others that she mentioned to you. But she also had a booklet, wonderful booklet on the table. And then you can see four other borrowed product, and that is also for sale. And she also created one in the center promenade. And she used to be a guide. Would you believe it? She is from Paris, and she is from France. And jumped into this city, she became a tour guide. How would you like that? Usually, New York and New York. New Yorker can do it, but she's a foreigner. She must have gone abroad. It also in China and in uh, Mexico, in Egypt, where I lived, and uh, was a, sh you know, like also uh, what you call um, herder with like the sheep, <laughs> and uh, a truck driver. So you have your choice of who I am. <laughs> you see, the foreigners. I am too. They have they have certain dream to come to this country, and not necessarily to compete with anybody. I never compete with anybody. Just to try to see what I could do. Not in Japan. Well, Japanese country. We have a beautiful traditional art and culture. Very sophisticated one, but. We have to learn from day one following the masters. 
I didn't want to do it. I just wanted to explore. So I thought I would go to Europe. But I think I will go and try the rest there, New York City. But I I went to undergraduate, I transferred from Tokyo two years in the Midwest. And then I applied for institute, I came here. So this is my my home quickly. Everybody who went to Pratt Institute as went away. I was the only one who stayed in Brooklyn. I said, if I move away from Brooklyn, Brooklyn will be collapsed. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it was horrible. So dangerous, you have no idea. But look what happened here. Brooklyn is wonderful. Williams is very wonderful. Everybody can come safely. And so she worked so hard. I worked hard. We have to, you know, linguistic barrier. Food is different. Climate is different. You have to get used to American mentality, which is not easy, you see. And so somehow she managed by truck driver, can you imagine? Many foreigners, they go through. I know Americans. Many, many Americans who came to this country, they have gone through very difficult times. It's not only us, but ancestors, they really worked so hard, you can imagine. You know, Chinese people, they worked. My goodness, you name it, everybody worked. That this country is made for hard workers, good people, trying to help each other. And it's remarkable. And that's why I'm here. And that's why we are all here. Okay. Thank you. Next one, Susan. Hi. Um, I'm a figure of mixed media sculptor and printmaker. Um, and the work that I have in this show, two pieces up there, um, the wood sculpts cut out with the sculptures on them. Um, so my work is always about something, and it deals with the human dimensions of social issues. It's often a reaction to the political and social narrative of the world around me. I take to heart Alice Walker's assertion that activism is my rent for living on this planet. And in that vein, I've done work on consumerism, homelessness, alienation, aging women's bodies, and the need for confluence using clay cast away from wood. My journey started in art in 1961. I was a sophomore at Brooklyn College, and I took a sculpture class at a summer session at the University of Wisconsin. I was smitten. I loved the processes. I loved being able to create physical expressions of my feelings and ideas, helping me make sense of this crazy world. I liked what art can do. It reminds us to see and feel, and gets us past the minutiae of daily life, and taps into our yearning for connection and meaning. As I said earlier, my work is always about something, but it's not a political treatise. When I'm in the studio, I, I work intuitively, and I'm aiming, aiming for an overall feeling. So the, my recent series, um, Confluence and Moving Forward, in digitally cut wood and cast paper, comes out of my concern for the survival of our species and planet. The work offers a vision for the future, that by coming together and moving forward together, we as a society can move past the hyperbole of the current toxic political environment. The work is made of cast paper sculptures mounted on birch and maple plywood, or um, cut that are cut with a CNC router. So how did I get here? My work is like called continuum, so I'm going to give you the shortened version of how I got here. Um, also, I'm talking about the progression of the work in terms of content and in terms of materials. You get a full picture if you check out my website, it's susangraber.com. It will show what I'm talking so everything starts with clay, actually. I love the malleability of it, the cash to our quality, and I like modeling. It fits the gritty social dialogue I'm engaged in. Wood, too, in various forms is also a major element that goes through much of my work. <clears throat> my early clay dioramas of the 1970s explored domestic scenes and issues of consumerism, war, and social inequities. These were in stoneware clay, 
and they, they cre I created environments and sections that fit together like a puzzle. Well, commuting to a job in Manhattan in the 1980s, I was confronted daily with homeless people on the street. I started a series of work on homelessness to bring the plight of the homeless people to the fore and show their humanity. I wanted to be able to increase the scale of the work, and it was difficult to do that in clay. So I started to use wood to create the environments and clay for the figures and other elements in the scene. In the early 1990s, I saw that in our efforts to protect, to protect ourselves from unpleasant social realities, our sanctuaries became our prisons. I did a series of clay portraits in wooden boxes about alienation, how we are all boxed in by our prejudices, how we are imprisoned from the inside by our own defenses and biases and from the outside by social stereotypes. I used old boxes because they have stories of their own and found them by foraging on garbage day and also I found them in um, flea markets. The work is multi-layered in content as well as material. The portraits in clay have an individuality. They're emotional, not stylized. They're boxed in, defended, trapped. So at the end of the 1990s and into the new century, I became increasingly aware of the changes in my own body and the lack of positive images of older women in our youth-oriented culture. I saw how the media constantly bombards us with images of femaleness that bear no relationship to what we see in the mirror. I began the Venus cycle on aging women's bodies. The body I depict, I depict is not idealized, it's shown as it is, with all its lumps and bumps and wrinkles, <clears throat> imprinted with life's experiences. I use the female body also, just like another um, sculptural form, um, to normalize it and confront the conventional biases about aging women, validating women's experiences of themselves. At that time, I became interested in using handmade paper. I liked the feel of the pulp, and I started casting the sculptures. I don't do body casts because I like to interpret the body myself. So I, so I make a sculpture out of clay, make a plastic mold of it, press the handmade paper pulp in the mold. It's very like a very labor-intensive process. Also, it's one of the larger pieces that I did took like two people four hours you know, to press the paper into the mold. So I was making sculpture in the round as well as reliefs, and I started crushing some of them. A friend came to the studio, a wonderful printmaker on Staten Island, and um, he saw the compressed pieces and said, wow, that would make a great collar. So I started inking the collar wraps up and putting them through the etching press. At that point, I was doing different kind of figures, um, full body, not just the torsos, that I did in the Aging Women series. So I was exploring these ideas in collar graph prints and collages, and then I discovered new digital technology at the Staten Island Makerspace that enabled me to translate my prints into larger works in wood using a laser cutter and CNC router. So now my process got more complicated. I make a sculpture out of clay, make a plastic mold of it, press handmade paper pulp and fold, take it out, compress it, ink it up, put it through the press, then I scan it into the computer, run it through a program that interprets the print for the router and laser cutter. Further developing my ideas, I've begun combining cast paper sculpture with digitally cut works, which brings us back to the current work. Thank you. So, your historical background fascinates me very much. How long have you been working on? You can see the orange one and then green one. And that is paper, cast paper. That's the technique. How long have you been working on cast paper? Well, I, I started with cast paper in the, uh, when was it, in the 19, Cast paper I started in 1990 when I was doing the work on aging women. That's why I sort of did this whole history because it you all, know, you know, builds on each other, you know, in terms of. Uh, uh, Would you like to explain to the room? How, what process that you have to go through? She painted blue on brown and white, but it is a paper. So you right. explain what casted paper. Well, that, that's what I was saying before. So I make a sculpture out of clay, and I make a plaster mold of it, and then I press the handmade paper pulp in the mold, and then I take it out, and then um, sometimes I, 
the, the piece of the um, orange background, that one I painted with a bronze paint. The other one is just the cast paper. I think it may have some um, materials in it. It might have some, uh, uh, sometimes I use onion skins. Paper is like, you know, when you're doing the pressed paper, it's very fragile. But once it dries, it's very strong. And I coat it with matte medium, and then I'll usually, I might put washes on, you know, have acrylic paint on it. The wood is um, is not painted, actually. The wood is stained. There's a, um, a, a dye called Cater dyes, and they're you know, wood stains, actually. So you can see some of the, it doesn't sit so much on the surface of the wood. It, you know, seeps into the wood. Yes. She did explain to us what custom paper means. But did you understand the method? Yeah, that's what I wanted to make sure. Okay, thank you, Susan. Okay, the next one, Julie's paper. So the collage portraits that are back there, over there, and like the bathers over there. So that's my work. Um, I guess I'll just talk about the collage of things that have made me into the artist that I am. You know those little kids that you see, the babies that just sort of stare at you like they're burning a hole through your soul? I was one of those. <laughs> and so I'm a, a watcher. And um, growing up, my voice was very nasal, so people laughed at me when I spoke. So until I was in my early 20s, I didn't speak above a whisper until I changed my voice. My mother was a singer. She had trained me how to sing. And uh, my first job out of school, I was working in the fashion industry. I walked into one of the design rooms and I said something, and the designer in that room yelled out across the room this large, you've got a job now, you're making money, why don't you go somewhere and learn how to speak? So I went home and I used what my mother taught me in singing. She used to hold a candle in front of me, and so when I sang or made the, the noise, I had to make sure I didn't blow out the candle. So I just moved my voice from my nose to my throat. So, but I was silent for, I guess, about almost a quarter of my life, and I spoke in a little whisper. And so, art was my voice. It was my way of telling the world what I thought and what I felt about what I was seeing. And um, I was sick a lot until I was in fifth grade, so I never had a full year of school until fifth grade. And my grandmother took care of me during the day. And her heat was a coal burning furnace in the basement. And I remember laying on the couch. And in the afternoon, the sun would come through the window. You could see the coal dust floating in the air. And so I used to just lift my finger and play with the dust. And it would make these marble designs. So. Art was my friend and my companion. Um, and for my mother, it was very important to her that her children have an appreciation of the arts. It's very fortunate for her that her children were all born with that aptitude. So we each fed a need of one another. And by the time I started school, I remember in kindergarten, it was decided that I was the class artist, not the pretty little black girl, not the girl who didn't speak, but I was the artist. So that has always been my identity. A couple of years ago, I was sitting at a birthday party for a friend who just happened to be all black women. One of them asked, how do you think of yourself first, as a woman or as a person of color? And I'm the only one that answered, I think of myself as an artist. And those other things play a role in that. But that's my identity. It's who I am. It's what I do. It's how I breathe. And, um, uh, when I was 45, I was like really, really ill, and I spent a year and a half laying in my bed, looking at my ceiling, contemplating my life. And I remember thinking, if I die now, I'll be really upset because I'll have died in the middle of an artistic compromise. That um, I used to design for tabletop. Um, New York Times had me as one of the, uh, I forget what the column was called, but uh, one of the creators of the, of the week or whatever. And I'd been in Vogue magazine all of those things were the things that I'd made. But I felt they were just on the surface of what I do. And I felt that if I survive this, I really have to change what I do. I really need to be in a community of artists so that it's feeding this need of mine. 
And that, um, and I also told myself that I always wanted to work with people who are ill because, as I said, art was my companion during that. So I started, once I was, had my surgery recovered, I was all better. I went to the local hospital and I sort of volunteered there. And I've been doing that for over 20 years. But one of the things I did was I did an art program on the psych ward. And that's where these paper collages come out of. I decided that I would have them do portraits of themselves so that they would see how they saw themselves, so that they could tell themselves what they see and they look at themselves. And they were, I, I would do one of myself. I would do just to make fun of myself so they'd know to have fun with it. And they were all just stacked up in my closet for years. And then I exhibit a whack out in Redbook. And one summer, it had been too hot to fire. I didn't, I was working in clay and I didn't have anything to show. And I thought, well, let me get these, you know, portraits out and give them the background just so I have something up on the wall. And I was really surprised by the response. And I used to be the manager of the gallery. You go with Tom, and she'd go around and she'd buy things, and she asked me what I did, and I'd show her my, my ceramic landscape. She had absolutely no interest in them. <laughs> and then when I did the paper collage, which was just to get something on the wall, Yuko comes over to me and she goes, You are portraits. <laughs> and that's how I ended up here with Law. <laughs> Um, and so when I, when I do the portraits, when I first did them, as I said, it was just to get something on the wall, but I, I wanted to try and tell some kind of little story with them. And then um, over the years, it's interesting for me to look at the exhibit here because it really shows my journey in working in the collage. So the ones on the top row are... Um, made from just the pieces that I did in the psych ward uh, and then just gave them some kind of background and told the story, except for the, the bride on the end. And she happened during the pandemic. And I had had the um, ribbons of fabric, uh, of paper, just laying around in my studio for years. And um, I remember holding them up and thinking, oh, that would make a great dress. And so I made a dress out of it, and then I decided that she was a bride. And then um, when I do the portraits, I cut out the shape of the face. I give it a nose, because that's the first thing that comes at you in the face. And then um, I'll, I'll give it eyes. And when I do the eyes, I decide, do I want them looking at me? Do I want them looking at the side? Do I want them sort of looking away because they're thinking about something? And then I'll do that and then I'll decide what are they thinking about? And that will make me decide what their mouths should be like. And then once I've done that, then sometimes I'll lay around for a while and I'll, I'll give it some hair and I let it slowly tell me the story of who it is. Um, and for her, because it was during the pandemic and people couldn't have their weddings, and, you know, there are those women who are bridezillas and it's all about them. And so, I think that piece has several names. It's like, it's it's all about me, or I can't remember the other names. Um, the pieces over there, those are all from my sketches. Uh, so I, I'm one of those people who loves to ride the train and sit and sketch people and think about what it is they're feeling at that moment. Um, the other day I was riding the train and there was a woman and she was like this and she was very... Um, deep in what seemed like a painful thought. And then she moved out of it and then she moved back into it. And when she got up to leave, she looked at me and I held up the sketch. So she knew that I had been drawing her and it seemed like she would forget that she was posing for me and go back into it. Uh, and so, you know, they, they tell a different story because they're from real people and I'm trying to feel the moment. Um, during the pandemic, the whole Black Lives Matter movement was happening. I think the pieces I did that are more what people think of traditional collage, where I was cutting images of photographs. And um, as a person of color, I feel what I wear, the history of our lives in this country on my skin. And people look at me and have they, they have their perceptions of who I am 
based on your own beliefs. And uh, <laughs> there's a little note on my door that was written to me by a friend's daughter when she was five years old. And I now realize it's been on my door for 22 years. And it just says, I love you. And I had to write over the key so that when I go out into the world, I remember that I am loved and I know that I'm more than just the color of my skin, what I look like or what my um, gender is, that I am a person who is loved in this world. And um, so for the pieces that I did during the pandemic, um, there's a woman who's dressed in the civil rights movement during the 60s and the 70s, which is when I was growing up. And then there's a young boy that was dressed in the images of what was happening during the Black Lives Matter movement. And it's painful to look and see those images are so much the same that all this time that we've been here and so little has changed. I also live near a hospital, and so it was nonstop hearing the ambulances go by. And they let the volunteers go during the um, pandemic. And I found that I really missed being there and doing the work. Um, but I thought about the people who work there, and that's why the piece on the right, lower right, is one of the doctors who works in the hospital. That's who I decided that she was, that it was really a sketch of a woman I saw on the train. But, um, you know, a lot of people who work in the hospitals come from other countries um, in this country that wants everybody to go back to where they came from. And... Uh, her, her, I think it's her underclothing is made out of the names of the people who died during the, the pandemic. And so it was, a, it was a period where I really did sort of do a collage of what was happening in the world and, and how I felt about it and how it affected me. Um, then when I started volunteering again, it was via Zoom. And I was working with people who were either chronically or fatally ill. And I was just me looking at them through my little iPad. And um, from that, I did a whole series of portraits of sort of the whole thing of, you know, Make America Great Again, which to me really meant Make America White Again. And I was looking at the faces of the people I was working with. And I, at one point, I looked at my desktop and saw that it was littered. littered with um, faces from people all over the world. That, um, I, and so I did a series called This is America, wanting to show how diverse we are. And I, when I hung the show, it was at eye level, so you're looking right at the person with all of these different emotions. And I wanted you to be able to look at that and think, Oh, I've had that feeling, or I thought that. So you see the commonality of who we are. We're all just people. We all have emotions. We all have feelings. These are the things that we share. Um, and so I, I, I like to tell stories of little moments that you connect with. Um, no, it's it's not one of the pieces that's up, but I have this one piece where it's called. At least I have my coffee. And it's a couple sitting at the breakfast table, and he's behind the newspaper. And it was I was at my ex boyfriend's father's house with his third wife, and um, I remember her at one point putting down her coffee cup and just her looking away. And there was that little moment of this is what she really thinks, and this is what she really feels. And so I like to find the little moments because I'm still the child who's just the watcher. We love a book. You see, Judith, you can see the portrait over here, over there. Three small ones at the bottom, two on the top, always holding the plants lovely. Look at those two on the top, down below the portrait. On the contrary, she can capture the expression of human beings. Look at this social, seeing, shall I say, different from portrait. And then this is a Williamsburg. It's a Hasidic Jewish community. So she can express on the big piece, black and white. 
and her brother is a jazz musician. So it whether that that person is your brother or not, it's a bassist, bass guitarist. Yeah. So next to her piece on the left side is Hoi Ai Oper Chicano is Oper Hoya. Could you please come over? Hiranouchi. Hiranouchi. She was the one who created. Won't you please stand up? Miho Hiranouchi. She is the one who created guitars and love letters. So she combined wood that is a guitar and then all love letters. So she she belonged to you belong to wood or you belong to both, yes. Two mediums she combined. So I want to introduce to to you. Happen to the next two Judas Judas Mark bases. And then two are uh, musicians. And so what remarkable thing about you, Judas Fruto is man. She can express three dimensional, just pure thin papers to bring amazing expressions. It's not easy. You can draw it if you are a good drawer. Any child can draw. But to bring three dimensionality to look like who they are. Look at those portrait two expressions to make it three dimensional out of just thin paper. That is an amazing piece. I was so impressed when I looked at her piece. Immediately I bought it. That's the beginning. Ever since we've been accumulating her pieces. Look at those detailed expressions. Who could do it? Just cut and make protruded nodes and then expression of the eyes. And you would ask, I could not what the exact question was, but about, um, I guess, um, climate change. And um, the only piece that you have in mind that has to do with nature is the uh, baptism over there. And so when I, I really dealt with that when I worked in clay. Um, for me, when I first started working in clay, it was to do the landscapes because I wanted to tell the story of this is what takes care of us, so we have to take care of it. And I, I wanted people to be able to look at my images and feel embraced by them, and feel the need to care for this planet that we live on. When I deal with nature in my portraits, it's more to show this is where we find comfort. And so for the baptism, I grew up in the Baptist church. And when I was 12, my mother said we didn't have to go anymore. We could become anything we wanted, except we couldn't become Catholic. She thought there was too much guilt involved. But we could become anything we wanted. Um, and I would, it went for a while just to see what I would do with it, really, my decision. And I would go the first Sunday of the month, because that's when they held the baptisms. And in my church, there was a, a pool underneath the pulpit. And everybody would dress in white, the chorus is all dressed in white, and they would sing bathing in the water, waiting in the water. And um, it's still a thing that embraces me whenever things are hard and that we find refuge. You know, for me, I love to hear the sound of water when it's pouring rain. I love to be safe in my bed and hearing that. I love to hear the ocean waves. I love to hear the stream. Um, I do things um, of trees because we find comfort in, in the and refuge and shade. And in my writer's group, I have written this piece that what if there were no more trees? Um, that all the things that it does for us that we take for granted. Um, so I want people to look at the world that's around us and, and feel what it does for us. She is indeed a storyteller. It, don't you think so? Fascinating. Yeah, it flows like a music. When you were talking, um, 
Uh, I have a writer's group I belong to, and they always talk about how the things I write paint pictures. And so I, I, I feel that everything that I do teaches me about the other thing that I do, that my mother had raised us to sing, to draw, to write, to just be creative. But I, whenever people say that they only do this one thing, I just feel they haven't given themselves the freedom to do the others. And if you're a creative person, you're a creative person. She, she talks about Mother Nature. She talks about your mother. And this is the Mother Nature show. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> Mothers on earth, they'll be mother. Don't you think so? Without mothers, we are not here. Without fathers, we are not here either. So we have to value men, women, both. Not one discriminate the other. That's the problem of the time. We are trying to make that happen here. Peace, harmony, and unity. Men, women, old, young, traditional artists or contemporary artists, all art, whatever we want to express will come together. So richness of art is a richness of history, and we value it. So thank you so much for your wonderful story. So we hope Chan, we hope. She, do you play? Do you play guitar? Yeah, I, 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 I don't play the guitar, but so I this so um I have so um you for told me about this exhibition and the next uh, exhibition coming wood and paper. And so I didn't have any idea. But so I and so I was thinking I was thinking about so so how should I explain my thoughts? And so I just I'm always I thinking about love. And so love means it's not personality, it's not individual, not individual love. I um the eternal love and the over generation and the continue the love. And because love can help the people, and love can also connect each other, and so just and also sometimes even even though um, the people they will love someone as that way, but so just so the love is continued in uh, in so our mind or someone's mind, and then so this show and I so make us so that this. Uh, it's kind of a 3D, and so the love letter I collect a postcard from 1932 1981 at the antique shop, and I was so shocked because so every age just so they love to the family and so lovers and the friends, every single one thing is a love. And then so just I collect and some uh, pick up some of my favorite words. And then also, and I was uh, imagining from the wood can make a music. And the music also can connect the people's mind. And then so <coughs> I just thinking, oh, the love, love song. Some people um, so play the beautiful music. It's so very simple, but so very simple. Music and but very so heartful, and then just I try to connect together the gira and uh, so some postcard, and so just and also, and so I type I title it's love letter to everyone, and that's my so that uh, my other work for this show. Wonderful, music is a universal language. Yes. You're going to have to speak Japanese or Chinese or English. We know, we understand. The same as visual language. We don't have to explain. It's right there. And then you can get what artists express in their medium. So the wonderful thing about art, beyond country, it's a universal language, isn't it? And that's why we can share the same language 
if you hear the corazón, the third one, you have tears in your eyes. If you have a cheerful image, you get positive feeling too. Those are the inevitable human response. So we are here, and thank you very much. Love the veterans, imagine this. So many people with exchange, love veterans, men and men, women and women, child and mother, so on and so forth. And then guitar, the music, universal sound. Thank you. Okay. Um, so next one is Emma Johnson. Um, I have these pieces over here, the shapes, the pink shapes, and I think I'm just going to tell the story of their time with me because I feel like they could talk and have more to say. Um, I originally made them in 2017 when I was working as an artist assistant to a sculpture professor. And I cut the wood shapes out of found trash that are from like sidings of a building or somewhere from around where I found them on the street. <laughs> and um, the plexiglass on the inside is from one of her students' past work, so it was also found after. And then this tissue paper was a new addition. Um, and it was inspired from, I used to work for a fashion designer at her boutique, and she wrapped the clothes in the tissue paper, and that's where tissue paper comes from. But this is the first time these shapes have been displayed without, or displayed just purely as artworks. I mean, usually I use them in installations, and they have LEDs on the inside, and they glow, and are triggered by either sensors or sound, or what's going on in the installation, it's usually based on the space it's in. Um, and yeah, they've been in a lot of basements, they've been in a lot of galleries, they've been in a lot of random buildings, um, just there to glow in an installation. And this is the last installation they were in. Um, they were glowing pigs, and that's why they're painted pink. They probably have like seven colors of paint on them. And um, that's why I titled them Geometric Bacon for this show, <laughs> because they were they had these um, pig heads made out of paper mache too, and had limbs hanging off of them, and there were six more, and they're part of this big installation that was bought from reimagining how we make our food when livestock is no longer a thing. So our food has to be made from machines, and so those were like the dead pig machines that were making your sausages. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, I feel like they've had very fun time as objects, and I love trash and looking at the top. Unfortunately, today, today is not really sunny. When the sun hit behind it, a wonderful image and columns come out, and you cannot see it, you can barely see it, but when the west side is the west side, when the sun hit, it's beautiful, translucent image will come through. And then she called it bacon or something, right? <laughs> Why bacon? Square bacon. Oh, because they were pigs right before this. <laughs> <laughs> At the Mosaic Project, for those who didn't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I forgot the things on the inside, the colors are from their old like lighting gels. I use, I work as a stagehand still in Hillsdale and I do other weird jobs and they're from like collecting thrown away gels. She is a junk collector. <laughs> <laughs> no matter what she makes, she makes the beautiful things out of detritus materials. And then this one too, I'm sure you didn't make any, you know, effort to buy. To buy materials is time consuming. When you look around in the street, there's so many wonderful things that we can take advantage of. And that's the whole point that I'd like to emphasize 
the trials of junk collectors I appreciate that. Isn't that right? You found those wood? And yeah, it's all from the street. I like, um, I feel like there's a lot to say on consumerism living in America and capitalism and everything has to be new, 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 new. <laughs> but there's always so much other stuff already here. <laughs> I don't know. And yeah, there's also like a weird subconscious beauty thing I feel like that has to do with a lot of what we value in terms of like objects and sometimes unfortunately even people and I feel like that art has been a way for me to kind of like instead of like taking that heavy thing and letting it bring me down kind of make a joke out about it you know <laughs> at, like at first when I did my first installation it was like hilarious to me it was like a big joke because everyone was like oh look at these cool glowing things and it's like haha it's trash <laughs> so, yeah yeah so it's whoever spoke to us it's a wonderful wonderful learning exam um, this learning experiences i really enjoyed didn't you yes and that that's what art is going to be about. Unless you ask, you never know the answer. Unless we have this kind of gathering, hidden stories never be explained to anybody. So it is a very valuable storytelling today. Really enjoyed that so much, didn't you? Okay. So thank you so much. Okay, so my two things are coming. Yeah. We, we have a nice evening, but one could not make it. I will mention to you Nari Skatra. He is a traditional sculptor in the world. And we have quite a few. Uh, pieces in our collections. Very unusual today because you have to have a studio to chisel, to cut, you know. Those are the traditional classic forms that Nari Skatra created. One, two, three, four, five. Both in classic forms or representational forms as well as abstraction. He has also, behind you, is a black and white. And those are rather abstract forms. One is in the middle, you cannot see, is a white one. And a small human figure that also belonged to him. And he has another piece, which is standing with an abstract form. One, two more pieces up on the wall, the bird, flying bird, and one on the standing balance. So those are the product of Nadis Petra. And he is also a wonderful cabinet of furniture makers. So he sold, imagine, beautiful pieces, couple of them, so he has to bring to the owner for both pieces. So unfortunately, he cannot be with us, but he said hello to everybody. So he, he is the only one in wood that he used hard wood to cut and chisel and made those forms. Okay, so I, I think I said enough. And first first speaker is Luke Cooper. Hello, hello, Luke. <laughs> Luke's piece is right on the wall. Could you please point out? Square wall. It's a hard wood, maple and oak. Is that it? Cherry. Cherry. And looks looks like chessboard. But how did he make what? It's a hardwood. 
That's what he is going to explain. Okay. Hi, how are you? Um, I've been working with wood for about 10 years now. Um, I am interested in wood because it's a raw material that has a life of its own. It's also very important because not only is it functional, but it's a natural resource that is renewable. However, in our post-industrial world, it is often reduced to a highly manufactured resource overlooked because of its ubiquity. Nowadays, people want their wooden floors to look the same and be free of imperfections. And as a building material, it gets highly processed into plywood. But when deciding to use wood, I didn't want to focus simply on binding and carving the most interesting single piece of wood from nature. Old master sculptors would spend months in the quarry selecting the best piece of veined marble, but I wanted to go a step further with wood and create my own composite block made, a composite block made from different pieces using both plain and imperfect pieces to imbue it with new life and imaginative dimension. Thus, my creative process embraces both additive and subtractive methods of sculpting. I begin by laminating individual, often contrasting pieces of wood. This creates a visual language of geometric patterns and spatial illusions that are embedded within, just waiting to be revealed. These formulaic grids and random patterns juxtapose the playful, organic forms that I then carve, all while accentuating the textural intricacies of the wood grain. Emphasizing the tactile qualities of wood, my sculptures push the boundaries of material perception, transforming a once rigid material into something graceful and almost alive. This recalls how Michelangelo prisoners were simply a means of freeing sculptures from a block of marble. But in my transformation of this material, the narrative is much less focused on man's domination of nature and much more on the complementary relationship that humans have with wood and trees. We breathe in the oxygen that trees produce and they capture the carbon dioxide we breathe out. My sculptures are a simple reminder of this cyclical relationship with nature. Ultimately, by placing the man-made wood relics in the gallery space, the viewer is able to examine the physical materiality of this wood, cultivating, hopefully cultivating, an appreciation for its natural imperfections and a reminder that like each human, each tree is unique and beautiful in its own way. I always make sure to source sustainably forested wood. While sustainable forestation may sometimes feel like an oxymoron, it's important as it creates balance by mimicking natural patterns and disturbance of uh, natural patterns and disturbance and regeneration. I also use it as efficiently and economically as possible. In fact, this piece here was made entirely out of cut-off scraps. Warp is a tapestry that brings together stories of different trees' lives, emphasizing the idea of individual and collective identity. By cutting the wood across the tree's growth rings, exposing the grain and character, the viewer can see what was happening in the environment throughout their growth periods. Part of the inspiration behind this piece started after I participated in a residency program called Land Art Road Trip, which was a program that traveled across the American Southwest to explore the intersection between art and the natural landscape. I was in awe of how stunning the eroded sandstone was how it told its own story of time and material. And I wanted to accomplish the same with wood. So I started experimenting with sandblasting. This technique essentially erodes parts of wood to accentuate the grain and bring out life. For instance, wood is made up of different materials of different density. In the summer, wood, the tree grows and the, the wood is porous and soft, but in the winter, when the tree grows, it's hard and it's dense. And these are what we call growth rings. Now, when you sandblast the wood, it mostly, reviews, it mostly removes summer growth. And depending on the power of the sandblasting, you could create a skeleton of just winter wood. So what does art mean to me? To me, art is an experience that attempts to connect ideas to feelings. My wooden sculpture is an homage to the life of the tree and all its beauty. They aim to renew our appreciation for this organic material as a natural resource, one that is important to sustain us. This piece here is, is actually one of the smallest I've made, and um, a lot of them are 
very tall. And because it's laminated with the growth rings, the end grain standing up, it actually, you know, I have pieces that are seven feet tall and from the dead of winter to the height of summer with different humidity levels, the pieces can grow up to two to three inches. Um, it's crazy how much moisture these pieces of wood will constantly take in and let out through the year. And, you know, that makes, it makes displaying them tricky. It makes preserving them tricky. But to me, it is also something that is fundamental to the material and makes it really special. These, uh, this material was once alive and in a way it still isn't alive, but it moves and it has life of its own. Um, one of my, one, someone I worked with would always say that water reminds wood that it once was alive because if you put water on wood, it just moves. Thank you. Thank you very much. The mystery of those hard wood, that is very true. When I bring an instrument from Japan, it cracks. And I had quite a few antique pieces that came from my fungus. And then upon arriving here and in a storage room, it all cracks in the middle of the night, you can hear cracking. So Japan is full of, hum hum you know, surrounded by the ocean and humidity is very high. So it, it's okay. But in this country, winter time, they have uh, radiators. So sometimes you have to have a humidity because air is very, very dry. So depending upon where you are, when you go to Southeast Asian countries, and surrounded by the ocean or hot. It's just incredibly hot. And when you go to the south, um, air is dry. So many people who have uh, congested, what you call this asthma, they go to Arizona because air is much drier on a high altitude or whatever. So it is amazing how nature corresponds to the environment. Now I know how you created warped chessboard in a way. I call it chessboard, it's not. It's not remarkable. You've been studying for 10 years in the past. Well, he wanted to show seven feet or 10 feet and how could you bring it? It is. We have a wonderful thing to hang it. But we talked about three days on and on, didn't we? Whether we should do it or not. Just like Grant. Grant who had a huge piece, he's no longer here maybe. Huge piece, he didn't know how to bring those three people to carry. So we have to have a bigger museum. <laughs> But I think this size is manageable, don't you think? And we don't have too many um, staff members, actually only one. And then depending upon volunteers. Thank you very much for kind volunteers who help us to grow. I really, really mean it. So, well, I went away to talk about something else, humidity. And then it's nice to be humiliated, yes, <laughs> or humble. I should be very humble for the fact that people supported us and then brought beautiful work. It almost makes me proud when you think about, you know, kindness. So those pieces you can see one by one has its own character and how artists conceived how he or she made to its final product. It's just amazing. 
and they do, they do not crush to each other. Don't you think so? They kind of blend fine. Sometimes when you put some amazing pieces, that takes over everybody's attention. But this this doesn't do it somehow. They blend, and that's the way those artists are. My third God, those artists are very gentle, very genuine, and very kind. For that reason, we survived 25 years. We will look for another 100 years. <laughs> we have to think long. So, next one is a Paul Fuga. Paul Fuga is a marvelous artist, also sculptor. He happened to live near the river, so he kept eye on the wood that he found at the bottom of the old river. Is that East River? That's where the start comes from, for sure. Um, that goes far. I'm, I'm very glad that Luke was here because that was one of the pieces that I was looking at uh, when I first came to the exhibit. And, you know, I know the material as do many of us, and I know the material to be hard. I know the material to be unforgiving. Um, but I also know the material to be an, a, a fun material to explore. You know, when something goes wrong and you, you, you make the wrong cut and you, you, you know, you, you, you do something that's, that, that doesn't work right, it gives you that opportunity to create something new and meaningful out of it. And that's where real originality sort of comes from and sparks from. And I think that's where, you know, Sometimes, not always, but sometimes good things can come out of bad things. And with my work, it started from that. Yeah. You know, Are you familiar with what he produced? Ah, sorry, let's do that yeah. first. Um, so I'm doing the wood origami sort of pieces over there. And it is that sort of, you know, tenacious, hard material and giving it that appearance of bending Warping. And you know that that I get asked the question, which I'm sure Luke does, is how the hell did you do that? You know, and, uh, and when I looked at his piece, I saw that and I said, how the hell did you do that? And I've worked with this material, you know, and I'm like, wow, this really has that sort of you know contour, you know, the things that see and see. Like I'm really, you know, I was, I was very happy to speak to him about that. And what I usually tell people, so what I do, it's an illusion. It's, you know, it, it's mitering two corners, making a 45 degree angle and joining it back together and smoothing it over. But what I tell people is that you start to concentrate very hard and you start with a spoon and then you bend <laughs> the spoon and then pretty soon you work your way up to wood. And that's <laughs> what you um, But why, right? So why comes from, uh, I was going through devastation, a hard period in my life and I started Instead of doing the things that I should have been doing, I tried to do something right, or at least as a form of meditation, just take long walks along the Hudson River. And I started seeing these seas of industrial driftwood. Um, not so much that, get, get in, in, into that, but this had like, you know, holes and nuts and bolts, of it, signs of its former life. And I was intrigued at where it came from and what I could turn it into. And as a form of therapy, I was just, you know, taking these pieces with a shopping cart, I was fucking crazy, um, and, and pulling them together and bringing them to my dining room in Harlem, which, you know, I was lucky to have a dining room, right? We ate dinner in front of the, in front of the TV like normal people, so that became my studio originally. Um, and uh, then later on, it was a basement, but with the last name Kruger, bringing clients down to the basement um, with chainsaws hanging around, it was not ideal. Um, <laughs> but um, but yeah, so I started gathering those pieces and, and little by little, things that I just wanted to do and really I was just trying to keep my focus off of what I shouldn't have been focusing on and, and keeping it in a positive light. I was building these skills to, to create something. Um, but being an artist is hard. Uh, I think, you know, doing art is easy, but doing it time and time again, over and over again, and committing yourself to that is very difficult. Um, things get in the way, like needs, uh, you know, uh, jobs, 
even success. Um, so from the sculptures that I started, I then created, well, let's go back a sec. I, I went to LaGuardia. All my life I was supposed to be a big famous artist. That was, that was the goal, right? Went to LaGuardia, went to School of Visual Arts. One year into School of Visual Arts, I sold out and went into advertising. Um, and then after that, you know, did a good career in advertising and that spawned my sort of, you know, during the time of crisis where I needed to jump into art, I did that and then started doing art. And then one year into doing art, I started a furniture company and, you know, <laughs> escaped from that and it's been very successful. We've done projects for Netflix, Apple, you know, you name it, it's, it's, it's growing and growing out of control. But what you lose is originality. When you have 18 people signing off on something, what I loved about the time period where I was sort of, you know, working through my therapy and stress and everything like that was the fact that if something got cut wrong or if I screwed something up, I had the chance to build it and turn it into something cool. I'd look at it in a new light and be like, oh, wait a second. What if I did this? That was originality. That was cool. That was awesome. Um, not so much when, like, you know, 20 people have signed off on a single thing, then it's, then it's a heart attack. <laughs> and, and, and trying to keep up with, with, with that. Uh, so I, what is hard and what I struggle with is, is diving back and forth, you know, going back in. And it always keeps driving me back. And that is the force that keeps driving me back because I want to be able to explore and create and come up with new things out of this wonderful material that I have access to now because I have a good shot. I have, you know, uh, access to amazing materials, but without that sort of time and ability to play with it, you're not really making anything substantial. Um, yeah, this thing here comes in. <laughs> Did you see those three pieces? Remarkably, um, designs are matching. Well, that, that is a creative process, of course. So what you can do, remnant pieces that you found in, in the river, and let it dry for a long time? So, yeah, I, I forgot to talk about that. Sorry. <laughs> Please let me stay. So the original pieces were pieces of driftwood that I pulled out from the river and everything. Um, these two pieces on the in the center actually come from a tree that was on a farm in Michigan and it got the twig beetle disease and started you know eroding in and out the trunk and needed to be taken down. Uh, so I invested in the tree, got it uh, kiln dried uh, to your point. It has to be air dried for two years or kiln dried for two months, uh, depending on the you burnage know, uh, for the tree. <laughs> um, and then but that gave me a lot of material to work with and to play with really, you know, start to build the Fallen series. And I call it the Fallen series because it really is just that. It's when this devastation happens, like what happened to me or what happens to a 300-year-old tree that's cut down on a property. And how do you start to see some new beauty of that? How do you turn that into something that's meaningful or that's, that's at least, you know, better and and you and, and strive for that so building it into that and, and transforming it into that and that's where you know sometimes bad things can be turned into beautiful things okay one of the pieces looks like antiques the way you polish you apply varnish or something like do one last, what do you do sure um, so there's a lot of ways to finish wood. Many, many ways to finish wood. I find what I like is a mixture between something that looks natural and something that does look a little bit more finished and polished. Um, so we use I, I, a three-part solution. It's tug oil, uh, a urethane base, as well as mineral spirits to cut it and get it smooth. And that way you have a lot more control over the layers and the buildup that you have. And it just looks a lot more natural, you know, that, that I find that, that if it's too plastic, but you also, I find that the, that if it's too matte, and what matte is, or satin, it's very fine sand that gets put into the finish so that the light refracts off of it and bounces off. Versus 
on the other hand, gloss, which everyone you know is against because it's just it looks like plastic and it's too shiny. But there's something to be said about the clarity, and they really should rebrand themselves as clear that you're that it provides in the grain that you look into the depth of the grain and it just creates that creates that depth uh, that you can look into it and it almost gives it a holographic effect, which is you know quite nice. Well, that's remarkable. Thank you very much for the explanation. Okay, Paul Kruger. The next one is a women sculptor. It's interesting because sculptor, using this word, means strength, you know, physical strength. And all the time, women created more paperwork than wood. So, this one person's name is Claudia Deppard. She is from Colombia, and she is the only one woman who dealt with wood. So please explain to you that to everybody. Hello, everybody. Okay. I'm already I'm from Colombia. Here I need to work for, for more than 74 years, and I love it. I'm very happy to be here. I came to the idea to be an artist, but just the light was coming. So I so saw right now I quit my job and dedicate to be an artist. That I'm so happy. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in Colombia, I was uh, always allowed to be a photographer on my side because I was working for a living, to pay money for a living, yes. But then I say, okay, I, I know too many things to do a painting, to do a sculpture, to do different things. So I, then I came here to New York and went to different schools to learn different, uh, different things, like I was doing pastel, um, pre-making, pre and a sculpture, and always, always at home, we have to reuse everything. So I say, I'm going to start reusing the things because I don't have enough money, and also I need to help the environment, and so that I don't need to spend all the time doing for, to look for new things, need to, need to buy pieces. So I was fortunate that always I go pieces of, uh, like for example, aluminum to make big pieces, or, or cardboard, I use cardboard, I use uh, all pieces of wood. And doing kayaking on the, on the Hudson River, I saw wonderful pieces. I just saw the I in image that this can be a piece, a, a fantastic piece. So I need to be in this here. <laughs> so this is my second thing that I found, my third thing that I found in the river. So when I was in kayaking, I saw this piece, I said, oh, I need to bring this piece home. And I brought the piece home and start talking to the piece. Tell me, tell me what is your stories? What is that? And I did it, wanted to transform the form. Because the form for me sometimes was like a, a woman or a person just like now, right? Or here, if you just see the front, you can see it's like the open to the world, to the light. Why? So I start, this piece has been in my apartment already for seven or two pieces, already for seven or more years, dry, because it was, was uh, wet. So always I was touching and touching, and I was trying to, somebody told me, because I don't have anything, <laughs> I'm very empiric in, 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 in the part of wood. So I said, okay, if you want to uh, borrow, um, how do you say, 
does very hard with the oil from the world from the wood is coming out. And really was coming that shape and that color. He said, wow. And I blow it. So I was really enjoying that. So I said, well, okay, inside when to have the group, I said, I'm going to put from the place from the uh, like the symbol is from the place that's coming. So it's coming from the river. So I put the blue. So to reflect that it's coming from the river. The peace come alive and I wanted to keep everything. What I put it after I just pull it along with my hand or a little sandpaper, I just put on the watch. Watch. So like to keep the in in the natural, the natural style. So that is, that was the, the idea of the graphics. So let me see the other one. Oh, and also I did this. So you can move it on the side. You can go to the table. So I'm home where sometimes I need some. Okay, so I, I really have the energy. Okay, with this thing, when I saw the piece, I just say, oh my God, it's looking like hell. So sometimes you can think that it's the hand. Look at this. Say, help me, help me. And I say, okay, I'm helping you. You are coming with me home. <laughs> so I took this to with me and I started looking. And sometimes I saw like it was a pregnant, a pregnant, pregnant woman. Sometimes I saw my hand is asking me for help. And I start again, when you see the piece in the in the in the way that natural way, not in the way that was because how many years do you think was in the video? Like you say, from where it's coming? I don't know. I don't know what happened to this piece. So I say, okay, tell me. Tell me what is happening to you. And I hear that nonsense. I say, oh, well, I was here, I was there, I a, a storm, I was in this sun for three years. And I say, okay, you are going to tell me this story. And I start again, touching, touching, and touching. And like, come alive, you know, change the color. So fantastic. So now, I say, I'm going to say the same thing. I'm going to use the same blue to tell me the story. And I put the blue in top. And the blue went to all the cracks, the hats. And each one is telling you a story. If you can come here, and you come here, it's telling you the stories about where they was. So I'm very fascinated in doing pieces of this kind of wood. I know a I don't have too much knowledge about the wood like this guy. <laughs> yeah. But I think that was important to recover life from the pieces that you get. Always I'm looking for pieces around and I always become other story. I was telling me other stories. I I pick up a lot of different things, on construction sites, on the street. Everything and always a kind of thing. Get a new story from that. Uh, so I think it's very important to use always things. I learned that from home because we are, we are a lot of kids. So we need to get the news from the big ones to the close to the small ones. And everything was like that. So I, I recommend you also to always be used for those. Now I'm doing the plastic uh, we bottles of plastic, uh, plastic bottles. Trying to do also a new 
is my, is my first time that I'm doing working now with plastic, uh, um, reducing plastic bottles. And I think it's going to have something good from there, telling me the stories. <laughs> okay, thank you. Wonderful, wonderful story. And uh, so we can embrace our um, mother nature, wood, or anything for that matter. So there is a new arrival. Good timing. Dan, do it. You are the next one. You came on time. You kind of sense. Oh, there is a. Who is three pieces are right here? He is an art book artist. I've known him for a long time. So let him talk. Marvelous artist. Welcome, Doug. Thank you. Sorry for being late. I had another event prior to this. And I do have some notes. I'll try and speak with them. So I'll try and be uh, brief based on what Yuko had asked. So I'm just going to um, have some ideas to share with you. So I'm a mixed media artist and I'm working in photography, uh, stop motion animation, book work, and installation. I've been working for a very long time and that I found these particular books. This one is by Adrian Tomai. It's a graphic novel. I don't know if anybody's familiar with it. It's a very well known graphic novelist. And this is the piece that I did, which is called Double-Sided Shortcomings. And um, could you open my So when I saw this, I was very inspired not only by the story, but by the content, but the traditional nine cell version. Now, when I was a graduate student at the Visual Studies Workshop studying photography, and I started morphing into making book work, I did a book, 1979, where I cut out um, uh, Uncle Scrooge meets uh, the Buccaneers or something. And I cut everything from the background, thinking this is photography, but I'm now reducing photography in the background and to layers. When I did that book, it probably took me a month and a half, and I said, I'll never do this again. <laughs> and now I'm more patient. So um, there are a lot of details about this book, but the book itself is about a relationship between this Asian American man having a relationship with his girlfriend, an Asian American woman. It doesn't work out, and he tries to uh, date a Caucasian woman, who turns out to be um, non-binary. <laughs> And then he loses out on her, and then he goes back to California. So the I ideal uh, aspect of this is, what is it that in our Facebook era that, we, that we're known? We're known by people who we interact with directly, but we're also known through social media. So I had this sense of, it's called the Speechless series, but this is that one is called um, Double-Sided Shortcomings, because I've removed a lot of the content that gives signals to who we are. So that now it's reduced to emptiness. So how do we express ourselves and our lives within emptiness as well as what we actually hear? It's the space in between that I wanted to explore in that. And I've had, I have many different uh, iterations of this particular book. Uh, that one is 10 pages that I worked and I actually did the entire book, which took me a year and a half. And then all the outtakes become an upcycling form of the book, so you could actually see the quantity of speech that has been taken out. And in any of us, in a relationship, what we see, what we don't see, what we take in, what we give, we can be anonymous with it, but sometimes we very much feel that silence or anonymity. And how do we deal with that in our own life in a contemporary culture that's just, you know, the plethora of, um, of social media and talking about how we are all connected, and it may just be a fallacy on that level. The other um, question that uh, was asked, um, so the ideas are what I call a mashup of the content of the original author's books and reconfiguring them into the sculpture. So essentially we're taking a rectangle, I'm taking a rectangle and transforming it into a three-dimensional element. 
So it's bringing the content and appreciating it um, in a different way. So this book is called uh, Charlton Laird's um, The Word, and the full title is A Look at the Vocabulary of English. So all the books that I use, 99% of them, they're configured in a way to express not only the author's work, but my interpretation of that. So it becomes an editorial of that particular work. And each work that I do, I try and push myself further so that I'm not repeating myself. And um, I've been pursuing the same and similar subject matter for a long time. Again, mentioning this earlier book, this um, Donald Duck book that I did, never thinking that it was going to continue to pursue it. I somehow keep getting ideas and, and obsessing over that. Um, so I am upcycling books and saving them from landfill. We have billions of books, and what are we going to do with them as we have a digital age? I love working on the computer, and I love being read to uh, with my digital books, but I also enjoy the imagination and the eyes moving across, traversing the eyes. So every Think that aspect of reading, I'm very interested in the process. I think I um, sort of reimagine the process of what does it mean to start here and then to go here with the eyes and going back and forth. And I did a piece many years ago uh, which takes in, let's say, this book, and I calculated how far the eyes move from left to right. And then I actually did a piece with string, black string, and it showed the distance that the eyes actually move back and forth, back and forth, and how much space we take in. So I'm always looking at the transformation of the text to the content based on my interpretation of a contemporary culture. And that's how I'm informed with um, a lot of my work. I try to incorporate what I see, what I feel as um, in a modern age. And it's always challenging to make meaningful work about our time using my skill set that pushes uh, the boundaries and the materials um, past my sensibilities so that I'm not repeating myself, which is why I have this here today. <laughs> um, and as long as I continue to have those ideas, I'll continue to work within the medium um, as long as it continues to be fresh. And then as an artist, I'm, I'm the one that changes by it. I don't expect anybody else to be. If they are, then I'm grateful that that happens. But I have to work with the materials and learn the materials and transform them and work with them to the point where I'm pushing them until they actually break. So for instance, the double-sided um, short company, Cummings, what happens if I cut too far? Well, then I glue it. But it is that idea of pushing the idea further and further and also the materials together. And um, when I look at a, a book, I look at its content and I think, how can I transform it into a sculpture? How can I make it say something that has never been said before, hopefully? And that's what keeps me working with this idea of uh, the book. And I'm grateful to um, Yuko for um, this gorgeous place and, uh, and uh, having some of her, some in my work in her house. <laughs> and uh, thanks very much, and thanks for coming. <clears> that <throat> for instance, how long did it take you, the one in the middle, you use exact knife to uh, cut and the, then you say The double-sided? Mm -hmm. Which one? The middle one. The middle one. So that's the... Oh, did you say the middle or little? The middle. middle one. Oh, the middle one. So the graphic novel. Mm -hmm. So the graphic novel took me probably a good uh, month. Yeah, uh, but that's uh, consistently cutting for hour, many hours at it during the day. I used to listen to a lot of music, jazz, watch Twilight Zone, and I don't do that anymore because I just want the silence. You know, we're inundated with so much input externally, so when I work in my studio now, it's usually I'm just there, and it gives me a chance to really think about the work. I have friends who are painters and they they can work and um, listen to books on tape or music. I no longer do that because I'm still thinking about the work when I'm working on the work. So that's sometimes it takes me that length of time. And then the precision and working out of what I do. Actually, this may be of interest to people. Um, Adrian Tomine drew his book originally once, 
but I've, drew, I've drawn it twice. And how I work in that particular piece is on the side that I don't want to cut, because I like the arbitrary quality, is I have to outline everything. And then I also draw the, um, draw the connecting lines, which I didn't do in the first, um, um, what was it, uh, Uncle Scrooge book. So the, the figures kind of flopped. But by connecting them, it creates a sense of linkages. And that, to me, is an important aspect of how the computer has in, in, in inspired me. Because we have linkages, we have cutting and pasting. So I use those terms in the work. So sometimes it's structural, and then sometimes, well, it's always structural, but it becomes an aesthetic. So I have to really be precise with how those lines are cut. Because the physiognomy is always recognized in the, uh, in, in the book. That is, you know what a speech bubble is based on our culture. You know what the face looks like. And so it's like that sense of emptiness. Well, when there's emptiness, what's there? You know, it's the spirit that fills us, the sense of silence. And that's very much what every human being is, which is silence with emptiness, but also fullness. So that was the inspiration for doing that piece. So the dome, um, uh, the dome. So that's from this book, so which is the word. So it's exploring the word. I think, um, I think it's called um, Bottom Feeder. So I've, I've written a story about it, and the, the Bottom Feeder is about when books are not used, my sculptures go in and kind of suck up the ideas, and then they're transformed by those ideas. It also, um, it's just, it's, it's a visual element. It's kind of quirky because how does that book stand on its own? It's paper. So I have all, I'm like a magician, and I wanted to be a magician when I was a kid, so. Now it's kind of like the magic of defying. This is paper, and yet it still has some strength and tenacity to it. Um, you know, the cover is like a monk's cover, or reminds me of um, um, what was a great Canadian writer with uh, the wigs, um, favorite writer. I'm from Canada. I'm blanking out. Sorry. Um, what's her name? We did with the women and wearing the hoods. Barbara uh, Atwood. Yes, Barbara Atwood's book. You know, I saw those images, so that could be an inspiration as well. He, he is from Canada, and when did you come to this country? When did I come? To America. Oh, so um, I came to the States in 1975 when I ran away to travel with the circus and photograph circuses. <laughs> And then that became too real and I ran away from the circus. So, and then I um, ended up, it's a long story. We have a lot of people on our council here. Um, and then I ended up working for a very famous photographer, Minor White. And I never knew that I was gonna be doing this kind of work until graduate school, where I went to graduate school in Rochester, New York in 79. One of my compatriots there was uh, Adam Weinberg. How many know Adam Weinberg? So Adam is the uh, director of the uh, Whitney Museum now, but um, we don't get to talk anymore. <laughs> He's, uh, but anyway, that's how I, I've developed. Like many of us, I, none of us knew where we were going to go at that time, but somehow I've managed to maintain a full-time career as an artist and uh, some other elements. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Doug, you made it. Did you see those pieces on the pedestal? Okay, next, Erin. Um, I'm Erin Matthewson. I'm an illustrator and pop up paper engineer. Uh, my pieces are the cyclone roller coaster and then the wonder wheel and the ocean back here. Um, and I went to Pratt for illustration because I really liked how you can do it in any medium. I like exploring with different materials. Um, and it was at Pratt that um, in a class assignment, we first went to Coney Island, or I first went to Coney Island. Um, and the second I stepped out of the subway, it was instant inspiration, love at first sight. The rides, the sideshow, the colors, the signs, everything. I just clearly am still inspired by it. Um, there's just a wonder and a magic that I find in Coney Island and in sideshow and circus, and um, specifically, in today's society where you can just 
evil how a magic trick is done and take all the magic out of it, I think it's um, important to hang on to that wonder wherever you can. So um, I unfortunately wasn't able to take the pop-up class at Pratt, um, but it was always in the back of my head that I wanted to explore this. But it wasn't until um, 2019 I participated in the sketchbook project, which if you're unfamiliar, they have themes, they send you a sketchbook, you fill it up and mail it back and it's in their permanent collection. And that year, um, one of the themes was bizarre. So it was like, perfect, I can do SciShow, but I wanted to add something more. I wanted some movement, some 3D element. So it was like, okay, I'm going to start playing with pop-ups. So just basic folds, just simple hinges, making a sword swallower, um, you know, actually swallow the sword. Um, but that's often how my ideas come to me. I'll, I'll have a flash of the final idea, but it's always how can I recreate this motion or movement, or how can I recreate this structure? Um, with the Wonder Wheel, it was specifically the swinging cars. That's what makes the Wonder Wheel special, like as stationary and swinging cars. So I wanted you know, to spun around to have those cars swing. Um, with the Cyclone, it was strictly just the structure. Just I didn't even add any other illustration to it. It was just hand cut board, white on white, um, and the shadow. And I thought that was very striking for that. Was pop up? Yes, pop up books. And that's the other thing um, with the wonder of Coney Island and Sideshow. I think pop up book also has that wonder and element of surprise so they go hand in hand very well when you open the book and it's exploding off the page um so that was where i kind of started playing around but then i found out about pop October, which is just an online instagram challenge that there's different prompts every day and but it's professional paper um, pop-up artists that are making pop-up books for their um, profession and then beginners and it's just so inspiring seeing how everybody interprets the words, how everybody is um, creating different um, mechanisms and techniques, and everybody's just feeding off each other's um, creativity. And even though I work primarily on my own, I don't really collaborate too much, um, though I'd be open to it, um, I definitely thrive in that kind of creative community where everybody is just kind of learning from each other and um, just uh, feeding off each other's creativity. Um, at that point, I was still kind of just teaching myself, pop up, kind of watching YouTube tutorials and whatnot. Um, but then the pandemic hit, and for the first time maybe ever, I was laid off and three months, I didn't know how long it would be, but three months that I could just actually have the time to devote to learning this and um, all the projects that I always wanted to do that I never had time. So. I wanted a little bit more structure. I wanted to see how professional paper artists were kind of approaching projects. So I found um, a class online through Domestica, which is a great website. They have creative classes on anything you could imagine. Um, and that class was for a um, pop-up travel book. So I did a um, Coney Island um, day trip. So I had, I was already inspired by Coney Islands, um, and I had in the back of my mind wanting to work out the parachute jump and the wonder wheel, but now I finally was able to devote time to those structures um, and creating those. And all those projects are on my Instagram, errands, et cetera, as if anybody's interested. But um, basically all pop-ups, no matter how complex, they're all starting with very basic, fold, simple mechanisms, and then it's just, combining mechanisms, adding, making it bigger, more elaborate. Um, but it's all just problem solving and trial and error, cutting it out, assembling it. It didn't work, adjust, cutting it out, assembling it, just over and over until you finally create that motion that you're trying to, or create that structure. Um, and when it finally all comes together, it is magic. It is just still exciting, you're just like, Look what I just made. It's actually doing what I wanted it to. So um, it's, always, it's generally always structure first and then figuring out the illustration on top of that. Um, and generally with the pop-up, I do it um, digitally because it's just easier to adjust and make changes. 
um, because even once the structure is done, they're still adjusting. Um, but sometimes, like, the cyclone was strictly the cut board. Um, this one, the wheel, I have done digital ones before, so I learned kind of worked out that mechanism. But that one I did all in cut paper, which I, I really enjoy collage, and I, I hope to do more of that. Um, but also using um, recurring subject matters, um, once I have the digital drawing, um, like with the site, with the uh, Coney Islands things, like I, for that pop-up book, I was able to draw all the rides and all the businesses and everything. Then I have that digital drawing to use for other things. I do a lot of vendor markets in Coney Islands. Once it, I have the drawing, I'm turning into earrings and hairpins and uh, Christmas ornaments and whatnot. So, um, and that's really one of the ways I've kind of, I first got into the Coney Island community was doing vendor markets there. Then that opened up the opportunity to, I painted my first murals out there, which was incredible and daunting, but having my art in my favorite place in Salt is a dream come true. Um, and then that opened up to some Coney Island art shows, which opened up to me finding out about this art show. Um, so it's really, I've been lucky that it, things just keep going one step to the next step. And um, I just continue to keep learning new techniques, um, growing as a paper engineer. And I think I'll always go back to Coney Island and Sideshow because I still find the magic and the wonder in it. Um, and I like creating the unexpected and kind of sharing it. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Erin. Coney Island product. <laughs> okay, so next one is Prima. She has one over there. Big with um, video inside. Bastard. The other one is American Hero. So here she is. She's going to talk about it. Well, I won't bring them up and put them on the table. So, <laughs> so um, I'm going to kind of answer Yugo's questions because I've learned from the past she likes when you do that. So I did look at your questions. <laughs> so um, in my 20s, um, my first real job as a sculptor, I worked for Macy's Parade Studio. I was um, became one of their head sculptors there. I learned all, a lot about... Uh, numerous materials, worked under their head carpenter for a year to learn structure and carpentry, and um, then ended up having my own prop and promotional business uh, where I did Bloomingdale's Christmas windows for years and giant telephones and a cityscape made out of Eggo waffles and whatever anybody wanted to have me make. So my, my craftsmanship uh, that's where I honed in to uh, be able to make, as far as I can think, anything that I can think of, I think I can actually physically make. So um, that's really free for an artist, not to be held back by uh, their own abilities to actually be able to say, I want to work in wood, I want to work in metal, I want to work in found objects, I want to work in foam, I want to carve or I want to do video work or whatever. So um, so that's kind of my background. Um, yeah, both of, so both of them allowed me to, to experience and learn my craft very, um, to give me a lot of confidence. Um, but they both also taught me um, about the environment because both of those industries are completely throwaway. I mean, they're basically making things, especially proper promotional stuff. It's made for a night, it's made for six weeks, it's made for, you know, whatever, for whatever event it is, and then it ends up in a landfill. And that was, I, I struggled with that uh, when I did that for a career and started to work with found objects myself. Um, I went to school in Philadelphia in the 70s, and, um, collected a lot of things from the street at that time to, to work. The streets were filled with trash at that time. Anybody who was um, my age knows any of the cities in the 70s were trash heaps. 
they were really struggling. The, um, the uh, cities weren't working very well. Garbage wasn't getting picked up. And it was a heyday for an artist that worked with trash. So <laughs> I did that. So, um, so that's where I started work, uh, doing work that I would say cared about Mother Earth. So I felt like I was trying to compensate for the, my profession. Um, then 9-11 happened. Um, I lived down at the Fulton Towers, Ground Zero at the time, and my studio was in, uh, in Dumbo. <coughs> so I used to walk across the bridge with my cat in a carrier, uh, came to my studio every day, and um, I was carving the giant Santa Claus that day. I remember it very well for Bloomingdale windows. Um, and um, that day and that experience, I know I'm not the only one here, um, made me feel my mortality for the first time in my life. I was like, uh, really understood um, what that meant. And so what it also did is made me say to myself, I need to try and make my own art and stop making other people's art all the time. So, um, so I did, I kind of, that was like my thought on my deathbed, am I gonna be okay if I didn't even try to do what I think I was put here to do? So that's when I started really focusing on um, creating found object work for myself. Um, let's see. Um, so then I began making found object work. My work is social and political a lot. Both of these pieces are obviously social and political work. They're about mass incarceration. I have a group of work and I still work on that theme until that's not happening anymore. I think that's an important theme. Um, that all intensified when I moved to Harlem with my now husband, Joe, um, and saw, saw how differently my black and brown brothers and sisters were treated on a daily basis with the police, with um, even going into a retail store and being um, just everywhere and every way I could see that black and brown people were treated differently than I was. And it really, um, I started to get woke, I would say, is what happened, you know? So my work intensif intensified towards, those, um, uh, towards our injustice system, as I like to say. Um, my stepson got in a little trouble with the law over stuff that I, my, a cop would have said to me, just go ahead and go home. He instead goes to Valhalla Prison for 10 days. I went to visit him, if you guys know where that is, that's in Westchester County. It's a very white county, and I was the only white person there, as far as I could see, except for some of the guards. And that, again, woke me up to this and thought, there's just too much uh, inequality going on in this country. So, um, I started to read about mass incarceration. I started to educate myself on this stuff. And, um, okay, I'm lost on my paperwork, because I want to show you, talk to you about it. <laughs> Um, oh, so, uh, a couple of books, if you're interested, um, is, uh, where am I? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm lost again. So, um, a couple of books about mass incarceration. The, um, one book is The New Jim Crow. It's a really great book to read, just Google it. Um, you can learn a lot about that book from reading that book. And then also a book called Just Mercy, which I don't know, some of you might have seen as a movie. It was out not too long ago. It's a great book to learn more about how our country deals with uh, incarceration and the justice system. Right now, I'm just starting a book called The Sum of Us, which actually talks about how um, systemic racism affects all of us and how we've all bought into this, um, this concept in so many ways. It, it affects every single person in America. So that's a really cool book. 
There's also a racism workshop, if you would want to get interested in that, called Undoing Racism. It's a three-day intensive workshop. And if you're interested, just let me know after this, and I'll give you the website for that kind of thing. So, um, so my work is very intentional. Obviously, I try and make points about particular things. Um, and uh, Elizabeth Gilbert's a, a, a writer who says uh, talks about the arrogance of belonging, and that's what I think. That's where I come from in this. I just feel like I belong like everyone else, and I'm going to talk about what I see and what I learn. So um, anyway, so the pieces. So that's my background. So the pieces, GW Busted, has a lot of, they both have humor in them also, because I think if you don't work, if you work on these subjects without humor, people can't uh, absorb it. People can't get to it. It's too painful. It's too hard. So GW Busted here, obviously a oversized portrait of George Washington. He's got bars for teeth. His tongue is made out of plastic forks. I do a lot of work, again, with found objects, so, so um, his tongue is forked because we don't speak the truth about our history in this country. And um, his hair is made out of um, letters and poems from people who are, have been incarcerated. Um, I did this a while ago, so I do not know if they're still incarcerated. Um, I didn't actually shred the real letters, I copied them and kept the real letters because these people's lives are, are, are shredded. Often they go to jail for even just for a short period of time, a week, and they lose their job. And then they can't get housing. And, and, and this is a system that we've created here. So, um, and then in the back of his throat are uh, slaves in the field, Jim Crow laws, and uh, mass incarceration pictures. Uh, a lot of things have changed, and a lot of things have stayed the same. It's kind of what that piece is about. George Washington, father of this country, was a slave owner. Uh, this country was built on the backs of slaves. Um, as far, that's why he's covered in money. So there's all the symbolism there. It's very, very much a narrative, and I don't want you to miss my point. I'll hit you over the head with a hammer to get my point across. So, <laughs> so I'm not subtle. Yeah. Interestingly enough, um, she used Dara Mills to paste on all over. It's a symbol of capitalism. Those who made it out of slavery, historically speaking. So, as you can express very well, what this George Washington present way back. And also, I read Black like me, you know, salesman, a full paint, a white man painted black, and he tried to sell. He went all over. And he is a white man, but because he's disguised to be a black person, he was mistreated. Have you read that book? It's just incredible. So, as you can see, your what is this? Sister, brother, who has a mixture. If you don't experience, truly, you don't know what's going on. How black people walk outside, they get frightened every time. You never know what kind of treatment they receive. And unfortunately, this country, as I love very much, but still we have to work so hard to make democracy happen. Yet, we can express ourselves, which is very wonderful. If you go to China or, or, or Russia, we cannot even say what we want to express. And so this country has remarkable quality. America is still beautiful, and here is America is beautiful there. <laughs> so uh, American Hero came about when, um, after Trump was elected um, as our president, I um, suffered with trying to figure out how to respond to that for quite a while. And, um, and uh, then I saw Lee, Lady Gaga do the, um, uh, the Super Bowl. 
and she was told not to do anything political at the Super Bowl. And I don't know if you guys saw it, I don't really watch her that much, but I wanted to see this because I was struggling with what, how, what my response was going to be to something that I felt was not great for this country. So um, she did the song, This Land is Your Land. And I thought, oh my God, that was brilliant. It was just a brilliant song to do because it said everything that I was feeling in a positive way without really being political. And, um, and so that's how my American Hero series started, because I thought, okay, I'm gonna do something positive about people that are doing positive things, that are being heroes. And Colin Kaepernick was right coming out uh, on, with his knee and losing his job. And I thought, that's what a hero does. A hero stands up no matter what they're faced with, they stand up for the masses and if they suffer personally, that's what happens to a hero. And so um, his face is paper. Well, it's carved out of foam. Both of them are carved out of foam, by the way. So um, foam you buy at Home Depot, the two inch pink stuff that I laminate together and then carve. And then uh, his face is covered with maps, a uh, map of America. And um, in both his eyes, are images of people all over the world that have started to kneel because of what he did. And then, of course, Trump being really pissed off at him for doing that. So that's in his, in his eyes also. Um, the hair uh, also is like a halo and also like a flag. So it's an afro, it's a halo, it's a flag. And the oak leaves um, represent uh, strength and growth. And I think that's it. He's the first in the series, only because I don't have enough studio space to make another big one yet. <laughs> so, but I would like to make about nine of these um, uh, heroes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you. All right, next one, Emily Greenberg. Mm -hmm. I'm a, I'm a paper maker. Um, I did the salmon colored one on top with the wood frame around it. I did the little bit, itty bitty ones. Um, the lady standing right in front of me now, they're colored, plexi on the back, um, four little ones. And then I did the large um, one in the back hanging up there, which I call shades of teal. So I do a range between my little baby pieces and my big giant pieces and everything in between. Um, I've always loved working with my hands with color. Um, I, I mean, I, in kindergarten, I still remember drawing horses and coloring books and these long scrolls that my parents would buy, just continuous coloring book. And um, as one grows older, you kind of get pulled away from those fun things and your own instincts and start doing, studying business and going into a business career until 2001. I, it was just a coincidence that was also the year 9-11, but I quit my job in a bank and just decided to do other things. And I had taken, while I was still working, uh, classes in um, paper making at Pratt. It was really a wonderful experience because at that time there were a lot of artists with huge, unbelievable loft space in Soho. So you go there, you know, one class, the guy came in like an hour, class would start at like nine or ten. He'd come in an hour, the teacher, before the class started because he'd been out all night, you know. <laughs> it was it was the, the 80s really, or the 90s, I can't remember which one. <laughs> and um, so he was our teacher and he said, he would just go crash and say, do whatever you want. I mean, he had worked with Hockney and all these other, you know, great artists uh, casting their paper and, and he was a, um, kind of like in like master printers, he was a master paper maker, doing other people's ideas, not just his own. So, and then he just crashed and we'd have his studio for the whole day. And this went on for a year. Um, I became very good friends with one of the other women who was, there was only like, handful of us taking it. 
I don't know if Pratt knew this was going on, but we paid their our little tuition and got to do this. And so we said, oh, let's just do our own studio. We were at that point. So that was when Dumbo was Dumbo. There were no lights. And we would work really late at night. We found this really cheap space that had no heat. That's okay. We were, we were still young. And uh, I remember the, the last, we were there for a year or two, and the last time, she, she sort of like packed it in, I can't do this anymore. And so I cleaned up the studio, it was really late, and I just remember, because this was, Dumbo was dark, and not, no business at all, and I remember running from Plymouth Street all the way to the York Street Station, like holding my breath, and you're gonna make it alive. <laughs> but we got, you know, the opportunity to have a, a studio for like nothing, and uh, we learned, how to improvise because our this was like the professional studio that uh, we that the teacher had in Soho. I mean, he had this like four thousand square foot artist loft and all the best equipment. Um, so we just improvised a lot, and I learned my own paper making technique, which was like very primitive, really compared to what other people do. And I stopped doing the pristine paper, you know, the really thin, beautiful white paper you hold up to the light and you can kind of see through it and it's perfect. And then started doing really lumpy stuff because we didn't have the right press or the right beater or whatever. And I started liking that. You know, at first I was like really critical of it because it wasn't like other people's paper and then I started liking it. So um, moving forward, I was lucky once again we gave up that studio, and at that time, Carroll Gardens was really inexpensive. I mean, I regret not buying because you know you could buy a brownstone for a hundred thousand dollars. This was still in the nineties, and um, oh well. <laughs> my landlady has been, in some ways, my patron because she has not raised my rent. She doesn't tell anybody, especially her. <laughs> but she, she, um, I don't know. I just consider it uh, a gift, and I um, I thank her for that. But anyway, so I've had the luck of having a, a, a nice size studio, which I share with um, Maurice and Maria, so who's done those two wood pieces next to the three paper pieces. Anyway, um, and so you know we've, we've pushed our art making and, and all that, but back to, to my paper process. Um, the interesting thing is being kind of toward the end of the line, we've all said everything, <laughs> but at the same time I can relate to it, you know, like the push the boundary idea and not repeating yourself. I, I can't do the same piece twice and after a while I can't even actually do the same style, I just have to do different things, um, whether it's putting nails in the piece or, or whatever. Um, and. Uh, uh, just having fun with it, but there's always that struggle. Like, is it finished? Maybe I don't like that little wrinkle. I mean, I have an idea of what it should be. And I see some like wrinkle, I just don't like that wrinkle. And then I try to fix it, and then I ruin the whole piece. But my idea is, well, I do layers. So even though it was 99% finished, I just pretend it's it's like the, the white board again and, and put a whole layer of Thing and see what happens. And most of the time, I'm happy to say, I like it even better than before I ruined it. So I, I take that risk, even though when you do see, oh God, I ruined it, it's just a horrible feeling. Am I going to stay up at 2 a.m. trying to fix it, or am I going to be rational, go home, go sleep, do a little bit more each day until I like it again? Usually, I do both. I stay up all night and then hate myself and then relax for a couple of days and then go back to it. So there is this process, I think, most artists that I've talked to um, battle with, is it finished? Should I do one little more thing to it? Or am I gonna ruin it? Or does it really, or maybe it really needs that one more thing. Sometimes I'll have something in the back of a closet. I hate putting stuff in a closet because then it just, it's just meaningless. So, but when I do pull it out, I say, you know what? It's not really finished. I have to do, I have to do that one more layer. So, you know, and that goes back to putting stuff in a closet. I've always battled with why am I doing this? I mean, I wish I could say I wake up in the morning and I want to express myself. I wake up in the morning, I want a cup of coffee. I want to, I want to 
bagel. <laughs> you know, I want to call the friend. It's just, it's a little bit of, of denial, I guess, of expressing myself. But I remember once, and I've said this all my life, and I remember someone saying this to a really, really good friend who knew me really well and said, why am I doing art? Why do I want to do it? He said, just think that all the walls were empty. How ugly it would be if every room you walked into ever was an empty wall. So um, that I always go back to that. It's like, I don't want an empty wall. Really. I don't know why I'm doing this, but I know I don't want an empty wall. And I don't want my, my stuff in the back of the closet either. So I'm so thankful to Yuko for this opportunity to get it out of the studio one way or the other, where I have to hire a truck to get a big one or baby ones, but to, to be able to show my stuff here and get it out of the closet. So thank you. It, it has been my, my pleasure to be a collector. And uh, the Pony Foundation um, collects so many wonderful pieces all of your works are in the collection. But I understand being an artist, if you touch furthermore, entire piece will be ruined. And so when to stop is the decision making. And then either it's going to be a masterpiece or it's going to be ruined. And so artists know it's intuitively kind of confused. Shall I go further more? Shall I change the color? Or shall I stop it? It is a constant battle, isn't it? And so when you know when you stop it, you wanted to make it pink sand. It looks like a sandboard, doesn't it? When did you put those little gold or spot? Well, it's something I learned over time because I can't do the same thing over and over again like that one doesn't have that one's super minimalist just dark different shades of a dark teal and just the cuts but when I do this one which was after I got to do something else so I wanted a little decoration I didn't see the nails as oh I got tons of nails in it I mean maybe I had some angst at the time but that wasn't the real reason it just I just wanted a little sparkle a little something to catch your eye and maybe look again. So, but yeah, I might have put the nails and decide I ruined it. But this time I thought it, it helped at least. That, that really adds something on the surface. I love it. Yeah. Okay. And also she has made small pieces, there are four pieces, handmade papers. And we have big collections of so at the beginning, aren't they? Um, yeah, now I do more cut pieces. So I make a big sheet like those. Like I said, I, get, I can't do the same thing over and over again or use the same technique. So I'll make a big sheet and then I'll start cutting um, uh, strips and then uh, glue the strips or cement the strips onto like a, a different surface like plexiglass. So those are little miniatures, those four where the lady's looking, or not to the left in the image. Anyway, um, and then I make uh, Yuko has um, in her collection some large ones, maybe four feet by a foot and a half. We have six, seven of them. Yeah. Okay. Did we hear? Did we, did we, so next one. Okay. This Anna. This Pina. Excuse me. This Pina pieces are those two pieces on the top, like a lace work. Because our background is a Greek, so please tell us. Hello. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. All of you. I'm very surprised. Okay. I'm very inspired by all the artists that they spoke before me. It's, uh, you cannot hear me. Okay. Hi, <laughs> Richard. I will find the right. So, so um, I am from Greece, uh, Crete, Crete. I came here in 2010. Um, I didn't study here, I studied in Athens, 
my background, I mean, all my background is in Europe. I, um, after high school, my first studies was in uh, uh, French language and literature, and at the same time, I, at the same time, I was attending um, a school for art and design with a focus in graphic design. When I finished with that, I thought that uh, I wanted to do art more. So I went to the School of Fine Arts there and um, I started painting, even though my final thesis was um, more installation and video work and um, um, textile work. And uh, during my studies, also I had the opportunity to spend uh, six months in uh, Lisbon, where I uh, studied at the audiovisual studio there and ceramic tile studio. So some of my uh, video works were completed there. And um, after that, after graduating, uh, the Fine Art School, I, a few years later, of course, I uh, spent two years in a group where I studied uh, art therapy at uh, uh, the school there. And um, as soon as I gradi graduated from the art therapy course in 2010, I moved here in New York. And I had no connections in the art work. I had art award, I had uh, no connection at all, so I felt very isolated at the beginning and I didn't work, I, I was not uh, producing any work for a few years, but what I was doing for, um, let's say, consistently, it was taking pictures of my shadow in different environments, so that uh, I was doing that for several years. And um, when I became a mother, I noticed the difference in my shoulder that it had merged with the shadow of my controller and it became something else. And I was taking pictures of that shadow and that became the inspiration for this uh, pieces because the, the, the figure that you see in the center, it is the picture of my shadow pushing my controller and when I repeated the shape it looked like a butterfly uh, figure and uh, with the idea of, the, of a web I created two motifs and um, uh, I started playing with this uh, motif, uh, repeating the motifs or you know uh, make a figure, trying to stretch them and um, I started taking off pieces of the paper with the idea of, I, I wanted to see what it is behind. I wanted to, to, to create a layer, like a lace, in order to see what it is behind, another layer. And um, inspiration for that comes from uh, childhood memories of my mother and other women of my family uh, producing, you know, uh, embroideries, crochets, and um, it was something very dear to observe. And uh, it was always fascinating for me how, let's say, a thread can create so complicated patterns. And um, my first opportunity, let's say, to show the gallery came in 2017 when I saw, um, I was part of a group, New York Art Therapist Association. So, an art therapist posted an open call, uh, an opportunity, and that was um, brave enough at the time to say, because I was not very confident, I said, okay, let's try them out. So, I submitted my work and I was accepted in that. Uh, show and that was, uh, I was very happy and uh, that was the beginning of uh, this uh, work which I call Stroller Opera, this is the title and 
for all this kind of work because it has been developed. Um, and the Stroller Rotter is a work that I made, which is personal to Lepidoptera that um, describe the um, genes and also butterflies are part of Lepidoptera. So I made this work Stroller and uh, I combined Stroller Rotter and I combined uh, the two words two languages that I speak in my daily <coughs> life. So stroller is an English word and I combined it with the word pera that means wings in Greek. So I made this word and it um, is, you know, the, um, I, um, for me it has the um, Transformation is a main, main uh, part of my work. Also, uh, light and shade, shadow. Uh, that's why I keep the two pieces apart in order for the light to create uh, shadows. And uh, you can see uh, when the light changes or someone is more uh, when when the viewer is moving in front of the pieces because they are not attached. They, they they change. They constantly change, or, um, depending on the on the point of view. Um, I think I don't know. So I didn't forget anything. Um, what else? Oh, and recently I um, start adding punctured text around my pieces, and that was some. Um, same that things that uh, I find very um, interesting and very uh, comforting, and I would like to share with other uh, with the viewers. And, uh, uh, it is um, the the same. It's not easy to notice. You need to go closer because they're punctual, so it's the same color. It's white. Okay? It's not something that. Uh, um, but so it, it is as um, a viewer sent one song they like. It is. It feels like a grind uh, also because if, if they have some um, tactile feeling, you would, you know you could touch it because I puncture from the back. So there are little uh, you know, small bumps that they create the letters, um, and um, I repeat it around. Like a mantra around the uh, work, and uh, for me also it is a very meditative. The process of paper painting is very meditative for me. I mean, I need to be very concentrated, and it makes me feel very grounded. And uh, I enjoy it very much I'm doing that. Um, and I think that's it. For what I have to say for this work. The question is, the pattern that you created, have you, have you looked at something to make this pattern design? Yes. What? What? Oh. Mm -hmm. Design. So, the design I started from the picture of my shadow, and uh, I used that picture with uh, the idea of the web, and I created two designs. From those two designs, with uh, you know repetition or uh, cutting some some uh, uh, part of the design, I combine and I create new designs from those. So the source are two initial designs, and then I combine and expand and uh, create uh, two layers. To make the depths, which is very interesting. No. The, for me, the interesting thing is that when uh, this is the part of surprise, and uh, you know, when you uh, I, I don't know what layer I would use um, in combination, so I can try with different layers at the back or you know, front, and always a different um, visual result or visual, visual, a, a new image. Will come up. So this is a very interesting thing for me. And uh, yes, I keep the layers. It, it is important to have layers. And there is a third one that it's not easy to see, but it is at the back. 
I keep the paper where I can. So if you go close enough, we can see the marks of the knife. And also, because I keep the paper, I don't move the paper while I cut it. It is a design, a same design, it is a way at the back. So it is like a, a record of the process of paper cutting and it adds another, also, it's a engraved layer. So it is, there are three layers, but this is something that you have to go very close to notice. But it is, yeah, this is, um, look at this one too. Sunflower, it was done many years ago. We had another interesting show called um, Paper Works Unbound. So some of them came from that show. So remarkably, you created those lace-like patterns. And that one is also two layers. You've got this, there is a brownish, um, behind it to to make it very deep. So we I think did you finish? So no, you, no, I said I wanted to continue what you were saying. I wanted to create that feeling of death, you know, that there is a you know um, some layers that they uh, take you to a deeper mm -hmm. deeper in the base. Oh my goodness, Doug, he is going to be an ancient man today. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you. 